want to thank uh, Josh and Lori for having me today. Um, it's quite an honor to be here. I have a friend that uh, uh, worked with the Cary Institute, worked with Kathy as a PhD student when she was at Yale, and she was, you know, she was like, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe you were invited there. That's so awesome." So, uh, so, and thanks to all of you for coming out tonight on the first cold night to hear me speak. I appreciate that as well. So I'll get right to it. Um, so I know that uh, you're expecting contemporary art, and here I am showing you something <laughs> from the 19th century, but um, you'll have to forgive me. Um, these two pictures were taken about 100 years apart, and they show the importance of expeditionary practice in photography. So we want, when we want to know about remote or inaccessible places, many times we'll sp send out expeditions to collect things like minerals or plants, physical evidence. But at the same time, they'll um, usually with this small team, they'll send a photographer and um, in order to collect the visual evidence at the same time. So it's interesting for me as a photographer with a kind of an expeditionary practice background to look at these photographs and think about uh, how long this has gone on and how this ties into my experience. Because, of course, y'all may be seeing this. You can hear that I'm from Texas, so I say y'all. Um, and But, you know, what I'm looking at is, like, the gear, right, and the effort and the fact that here is a William Henry Jackson's assistants, you know, one of which is a mule, and, and because of the importance of the sharpness of visual detail and how they wanted to know the sharpest and clearest kind of detailed descriptive visual evidence they could get, they would send a 17 by 22 inch glass plate view camera, and he put it on mules and, and walked across the Rocky Mountains to take these pictures. And, um, you know, then, uh, of course, one of the sad things is that, one, you know, at some point one of the mules fell off the mountain and he lost not only the mule but a month worth of work and one of his most famous pictures. So he recognized in the way that photographers do that he had gotten a really good image even though it was on these giant glass plates. So he went back and redid a whole month's work. And, you know, it was not just an easy thing of getting in your car and going someplace. And then, of course, on the right, we sent uh, Neil Armstrong to the moon to gather that visual evidence uh, in the almost, you know, 1969. So, uh, so this image which uh, has always been a favorite of mine. You can see that while employed by the Hayden Expedition to survey terrain for map making, Timothy O'Sullivan managed to make one image that speaks to the progression of exploration, collecting, and conquest of the American West. Right, so the, the image shows the carving by the Spanish conquistadores. It says 1526. I've always read that as 1526, but it actually uh, says 1726. And then the ruler, Timothy O'Sullivan, added when he went through uh, that, um, which points to the kind of rational, bureaucratic nature of the American occupation of the West some 150 years later after the conquistadores went through inscription rock, right? And even the cut yucca, which suggests the violence the conquest meant to the landscape. So here's my yucca. It's actually the same species. So I have a long-standing interest in the stewardship of our, of our landscape and natural resources. So I completed, before I started the project I'm going to talk to you about tonight, I thought I'd bring in a couple of images made from before. So this was um, called Agua Quemada, or burnt water. And it's about the cultural landscape of the Rio Grande River as it runs from Colorado down to the Gulf of Mexico. So I wanted to reflect on the contested nature of this long inhabited landscape and place where, you know, water is perhaps the most valuable commodity. So I would travel along the route of the river, and during this period of field work, I would make photographic uh, slides of the landscape and then collect unique objects from the, the same place along the river. So it was like soil or clothing or plants or even trash. And then I'd return to my studio in um, 
just outside of Dallas and make uh, still lives that were illuminated by the transparent slides onto these still lives that were made from the objects collected along the landscape. Um, so collectively, these, uh, these assemblages were made to suggest a more nuanced narrative of the Rio Grande and evoke the immediacy of history and human presence in the, in the landscape itself, and also kind of our shared cultures. So, um, for instance, in this picture of the Big Bend, which is right along uh, the border between the U.S. and Mexico, this still life shows uh, a landscape that I took from uh, a viewpoint over the Rio Grande, and then the, the sky has uh, blue jeans in it, and the river, you can pick out a uh, a white cowboy boot, the pattern of uh, the tooled leather that we have on both sides in the Mexico and Texas shared. And then the landscape itself is uh, re it incorporates uh, cornmeal masa, which is uh, what tortillas and tamales and all our shared food is made out of. So to this, the topic of tonight. So in 2008, I read about the opening or the completion of the Svalbard Global Seed Vault located on an island only 600 miles from the North Pole. So this remote and secure seed bank is buried deep inside a mountain so tall that if both the polar ice caps melt, the collection of seeds will still be above the waterline. And so it's an interesting story, you know, as an aside. So um, when, I, when I came here, you can see that on the little right-hand side of the picture, there's a triangle, and that is the entrance to the seed vault. And in the middle is a little uh, bunker in the distance, which is where the airport is. Like, it's one of those places where there's just, you know, they roll up a little metal stairway. But um, I had climbed up behind the, um, behind the, the vault to take this panoramic picture of what it looked like from the point of view of the vault. And of course, I was standing there with a tripod and my camera. And I, uh, I have a view camera, which is like 19th century wooden uh, rosewood camera. And I'm standing there and about to take the picture. And this Arctic blast, this gust of wind, picks me up and the tripod. And we just skitter down the the mountain and I'm sliding and I'm you know the the tripods flying and I go by the vault right and so I land and you know and so of course like that whole story of losing the mule and being remote and you've got the glass plates everywhere and so I pick up the camera because you know it took me two days to fly there there's no other camera available and I kind of shake it off and it works fine so I <laughs> climb back up the mountain and take the picture so um so when I had read uh, that a modern day arc for plants had been built near the north pole I immediately wanted to photograph it. I was inspired by the simultaneously optimistic and pessimistic nature of the effort to create a global seed bank. On one, time, on one hand, you have volunteers and scientists and institutions from around the world who have come together to work together to create this botanical backup system. But on the other hand, the, you know, the gravity the, of climate change and political instability has created this need for an inaccessible doomsday vault at the North Pole. Um, so uh, this is as far as most people can get when you come to Svalbard. So you you make it your way into the vault, and then you walk down this super long tum tunnel, and there is this super frost-covered door. And beyond it is the vault. And um, But because... It of the nature of the vault itself and the treaties, most people cannot go through that door and be inside with the seeds because of the security uh, concerns surrounding uh, national patrimony and the, the seeds themselves. So when Jimmy Carter wanted to go, he, he actually got there and um, he, like I, got to this door and saw that there was a monitor showing you just what's on the other side. So he basically could have stayed at home and looked at it on his TV set, right? So, so you can imagine that um, two years later, 
after I initially wanted to go to Svalbard, and I, you know, make this long flight, and I've slid down the mountainside, and um, there I am, I've stepped into the sea vault, and it took my breath away. I mean, it's bitterly cold, and it's filled with this sound of this rushing air because they forced air uh, through the, the shelves to keep the uh, seeds at a particular temperature and humidity. So I was surrounded, though, by this fertile and diverse seeds resting in a state of suspended animation and literally being on the most biodiverse place on the planet at the North Pole. So the excitement and the awe that I felt being in this cavern filled with seeds and the kind of metaphor that you can, you know, anthropomorphize about that was just such a profound experience. Um, but uh, in the time between my first impulse to photograph Svalbard and now, and now Archiving Eden expanded into this expeditionary project that took me to uh, about 20 seed banks over four continents and um, from Australia to Brazil. So the first seed bank I photographed was the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center in Texas. And this uh, image actually shows dryland flora uh, being prepared for storage. So the the Millennium Seed Bank in England ha was doing a project where they had gone to Texas to do an exp a, botanical, a botanical expedition to far west Texas to collect dryland flora seeds for sending to their bank and also to uh, Svalbard. And what was amazing to me was that I got there and there were, the volunteers were hand counting and packaging the seeds by hand. So I had expected, you know, James Bond facilities. I mean, really, I just thought, well, this is huge technological endeavor, and we're going to have James Bond. But of course, you know, the reality of collecting wild seeds is practical, orderly, and performed in the simplest way possible so that it can be achieved by sometimes, uh, you know, only one or two people. So this is in Australia. And Australia, it's interesting, their expeditions to go out to the outback, they're out there, they have to take water, they're gone for three weeks at a time. And it's a really uh, huge undertaking. Um, once the seeds are collected and cleaned and stored, mi stored many of the facilities ha of the national seed banks have, uh, they pursue research on crop improvements as well as the technologies and methodologies necessary to preserve seeds for 200 years or more. And food sec security for an ever-growing population leads to a situation in which national gene banks can't collect and preserve all biodiversity, but must make choices. And most focus on cultivated plants. So even the US bank is influenced by what Congress is willing to fund. So both literally and figuratively, um, seed banks conserve seeds or clones and then stop time to try to prevent the materials from changing further. And as I photograph this constant agonizing quest to sustain the spark of life in these tiny vulnerable seeds, many of them are like the size of this, these orchid seeds. They're dust. But, you know, they're vulnerable because they're so tiny, and yet they can preserve this spark of life and regenerate after 200 years. So these, I became fascinated not only by the complex issue, issues surrounding the role of human agency in relationship to gene banking, but also the poetic questions about life and time on a macro and micro scale. Um, this led me to collaborate with research biologists at the seed banks who allowed me to, to use the on-site on x-ray machines to make images of the seeds. So Archiving Eden has dual si two sides. Uh, the photographs of the spaces and technologies uh, required to, to place seeds in a state of suspended animation and that we've been looking at, at so far. And then um, the digital collages that are made from x-rays mater of materials safeguarded in the seed banks themselves. So the extraordinary visual power of x-rays 
springing from this technology's ability to record what is invisible to, hu to human vision allows a different way for me to address some of my bigger concerns. And the, this is a detail from 1,400 ash tree seeds, which was interesting. Lori and I were talking about invasive uh, forest uh, pests, and uh, ash trees are, you know, being under severe attack by the emerald ash borer that is creating a huge crash in the, the population. So um, I'm out of I'm out of order. It's like the worst thing ever. So. Uh, <laughs> Holy cow! So, as an example, so uh, 1,400 ash tree seeds has a very specific number of seeds in the title, which refers to the kind of the process of trying to classify, organize, and contain, right? So, but the piece is a lenticular print, which unfortunately you won't be able to see uh, in person, but... Um, it changes as the viewer walks by from green to brown. So there, the stillness of the single print combined with lenticular technology allows you, as you walk by the print, you'll notice that maybe not at first that the, the color is actually changing. And um, so this, this tension between the stillness of the print and the changing of the color uh, reflects my focus on the elusive goal of trying to stop time in living materials, right? Which, of course, at some point we all want to do. So um, color shifts in other lenticular prints uh, between green to brown or green to blue ref uh, reference the process of drying and freezing uh, tasks that are central to the process of cryogenic preservation. And these uh, these are actually um, all. It's called thirst, and it's uh, all the different grains you can make bootleg liquor from. So the X-ray collages, while maintaining the visual acuity and detail of the other um, documentary photographs, invite a certain slippage between what's shown in the image and what the image is actually about. Right. So there are these. Uh, kind of metaphoric or poetic uh, layers of meaning that are in these collages. I'm interested in creating work that is open-ended, escapes categorization, and can draw on the subtle details that will allow for multiple interpretations and resonate with many of the questions I have about dispersal and containment or the race between reproductive power and extinction. So, for instance, this collage of seeds that took, oh, so long to create. I listened to all of Moby Dick while I was, while I was making this on audiobooks. And that's a big 19th century novel. So, anyway, but I was, you know, moving the seeds onto this kind of drawing one by one. And, um, you know, it may look like a cloud of tiny insects or maybe plankton floating in the seeds or clouds or even the Milky Way. And this, this is a detail from that piece. And for me, you know, this open-ended quality is exactly what, is, what I'm after uh, when I think about the tiny seeds and the collective effort to save our plant life. And through those, or the, through those efforts, possibly life on Earth itself. Um, and sometimes this fictional, uncertain, and imaginative imagery causes a friction when placed next to the realism of the photographic work, which I'm hoping creates a dialogue between them. So um, seed banks are based in traditional agricultural practices, but the large institutional and national banks that I photograph uh, also have ties to the Enlightenment and were established at, at the same times as zoos and museums, and grew out of the private natural history collections and cabinets of curiosities. So exo exotic plants were collected, traded, and put on display, and possibly even preserved, uh, their biodiversity preserved, by private individuals, as you can see in this 500-year-old collection of citrus in a Medici palace just outside of uh, Florence in Italy. So um, at that point, citrus was just being discovered and imported into Europe in the uh, 1500s. So um, this has been continuously there since that time. And um, 
anyway, so I was, I uh, was shown this by a, a scientist, and he said, uh, you have to see this 500-year-old citrus collection. He was actually there because citrus are really hard to preserve. Uh, uh, they're difficult to freeze. Anyway, so um, the scientists, and so there's a, a Italian tree um, and forestry institute, and they were helping the collection of the citrus here. And so they snuck me in to see it, and it was super interesting. And so while I was in Florence, I went to the Uffizi, and uh, I wanted to see Primavera, but also the birth of Venus, which is his other famous painting, of course, right? And um, so I love Botticelli, and I had this opportunity, and I was sitting there, and I was contemplating this picture, because, of course, the narrative is they don't know what this painting's about, they, because the, the, um, the uh, mythological figures don't really make sense from a historical perspective, like why these would be together. And I was, I was sitting there, I suddenly noticed this citrus collection. And I was like, holy cow, look at that. There's, I wonder if there is a connection between this painting that was made at the same time as this palace. And so I did a little research, and sure enough, um, this was commissioned by a Medici, uh, a family member, and there are 500 separate identifiable plant species in this painting. So, that was so interesting to think about that, you know, part of the display and the understanding of the botanical collection that this guy clearly was an informed person, that he had, you know, facilitated this artistic and famous painting at the same time. So, it really made a connection for me between what, you know, my experience at the botanical gar at this uh, collection, and then this, and then, um, and then I was asked to give a lecture at the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth. I don't know if y'all know that museum, but um, they allow you to do an artist eye where you bring one of your artworks into the museum, and you get to pick any. Uh, artwork that they have and put it si side by side to your next to yours, right? And then you talk about as a contemporary artist how it relates to a work in their uh, in their collection. And so I walked in and I was like, well, it has to be this one. And there was and the woman who had invited me was like, well, that's so strange. I thought you would do like a mandala from our Asian collection. And I was like, oh no, it's got to be this one. And it's because Jacques Degain. Um, I, I saw that, right? And y'all, uh, I'm sure many of you know the story of the tulips, right? That um, at the time when Jacques Degain, okay, so Jacques Degain painted this um, painting and it was the largest one he'd ever done and he never sold it and he passed it to his son. So it was like his favorite painting. And um, it was, he was friends with the director of the Leiden Botanical Garden who at the time was just importing tulips from Constantinople. And the, the, these were the tulips, you know, with the broken color that caused the tulip mania that I'm sure somebody's heard about, right? Where they were this, there was a speculative market on tulips because they didn't know what caused the break in the color. And um, they were worth the price, like one single bulb was worth the price of a cart and a horse. So basically the price of a car, right? And you didn't know if you would get one that would have the broken color or not because they didn't know what caused it at the time. So um, Jacques Degain had access to these because he was friends with the scientists. And at the same time that people were breaking into the Leiden Botanical Garden and stealing the bulbs, Jacques Degain had access to be able to paint them. So that kind of relationship between the science friends and the artists, I'm just, uh, you know, I think there's a whole situation that, you know, paper to be written or research to be done on that. But anyway, as, a, as somebody who works with scientists, I, I recognize not only, it, like, how important access is, right, and how important conversation is with these people, these people, the scientists, sorry. So anyway, 
So in my case, scientists have been invaluable collaborators, not only for providing access to these high security places. I mean, really, literally, they are so locked down because they're, the US bank, for instance, is under the NSA. So it's the USDA, you know, the Agricultural Service, but also the National Security Administration because it's built out of Cold War. It's a 1957 height of the Cold War bunker built in Colorado. And <coughs> so they provided access, but they also, uh, through longer term collection, uh, collaboration, sometimes, you know, including growing seeds for me to x ray. And this whole, uh, germination of my project came from being so interested in reaching out to the, Na the U.S. Bank and having somebody, Dave Ellis, who is now director of the Potato Institute in Peru, say yes. And say yes multiple times as I kept asking, well, you know, can I come in and photograph? And can I say, hey, look at that x-ray machine. Can I use your x-ray, $200,000, whatever x-ray machine? And he would say, sure. Like, can I put tissue in there instead of just seeds? Mm, sure. So it was really a very powerful connection. And then, you know, they've also influenced my choice of which banks to include in the project. So through conversations, I encountered these extraordinary accounts of the deep history behind, between, behind the quest to uh, preserve biodiversity. Many times these were stories of very close calls and s species surviving against the odds. I might get a little sip of water. So in, I'm going to tell you one of the stories. So in one of the stories, while photographing in the Millennium Seed Bank, which is where these x-rays are taken, um, I came upon a singular uh, plant in this lush tangle of their research greenhouse. And I was surprised to learn that this small plant had an unusual provenance that embodied the history of British overseas botanical exploration, collecting, and conquest. So a family had discovered a leather pouch of unidentified seeds collected in distant lands by a seafaring ancestor. <clears throat> and then although the seeds had been left unattended in an attic for two centuries, under the care of the Millennium Seed Bank, they germinated. And a plant that was previously thought to be extinct was rediscovered. So, um, so this individual captain had, you know, with probably not even intending to, had saved a species. And that's not, that's not the species. That's a, that is a yucca. That's red yucca from Texas. So, um, this story of expeditions and global exchange is probably just one of many possible stories that can be told from the exchange of materials and inf information between the New World and the Old that began after 1492, when you know Columbus discovered uh, the Western Hemisphere. So, the use of delt or indigo blue in my x-ray collages of eucalyptus plants which were transported to almost every continent, right, because they were what they were making ships masts out of at the time, uh, references not only the process of cryogenic preservation, which is central to the methodology of saving seeds, but also the intersection of East and West trade, cultural exchange, and migration. So continuing with this idea of global exchange, this collage includes x-rays from the US and Australian seed bank collections of plants they've gathered from all over the world. Um, I've combined the individual plants together because all these plants being re are being researched uh, for their ab ability to live in hyper-arid uh, conditions, which of course is one of the predicted outcomes of climate change is that our agricultural areas will become uh, quite arid. <coughs> and then um, this collage uh, includes New World exchanges that have a Texas connection. So uh, including mesquite and pecans and teosinte, which is the ancestor of corn and uh, eucalyptus. So um, I became very interested as I was going to these multiple seed banks on these four continents. Um, I became really interested in the stories of specific crops. So in Russia, I um, 
encountered this uh, dramatic story of expeditions, the importance of specific crops from the World War II era. So in the 1930s, the Russian botanist, agronomist, and geneticist Nikolai Vavilov participated in 100 botanical agronomic expeditions to 50 countries to collect seeds from all over the world. His aim was to solve famine through crop improvement and, um, and and crops like uh, potatoes like through crossbreeding. So in this picture, you can see the herbarium with potato samples he collected from South America in the foreground. And if you think about the timing, this was less than 100 years after uh, the Irish potato famine. And um, so pot potatoes have a personal significance. And this image is a 12 foot long scroll of blight, re blight resistant potato clones that I x-rayed in the US bank. And the a piece is inspired by my own family's history of displacement caused by the Irish potato famine. Uh, one cause of the famine in Ireland was the lack of biodiversity in the potato crop, of, of course, along with the draconian uh, policies of the British government. And so this is a detail from that. So one-fifth of the Irish population died or had to immigrate, which included my family. And interestingly enough, also uh, Timothy O'Sullivan, who was the photographer that photographed Inscription Rock in uh, the West that I showed a little bit earlier. So Vavilov, um, back to Vavilov, he had collected seeds and established the world's first comprehensive seed vault, which is still located in the original building, which is in a, like a palace in St. Petersburg. So at the beginning of World War II, Vavilov fell out of favor with Stalin and was sent to Siberia, where ironically he died of starvation. And so <clears throat> the scientists at the time didn't know what had happened to him. And um, they, they just, they knew that he'd gone to an important meeting in Moscow and he just never came back. And so they suspected the worst. So at the time, um, the, the siege of uh, St. Petersburg, Petersburg was about to happen. And they uh, evacuated the art from the Hermitage Museum, but they did not evacuate the seeds from the seed bank. And at this point, like once you lose biodiversity, that's it. You can't go back and recreate it. And imagine 100 expeditions and 50 countries, what kind of diversity was in this bank. So they tried to sneak it out. They tried to smuggle the seeds out. And of course, those were intercepted. And so finally, they decided to barricade themselves inside the vault and protect the collection. And then nine of the scientists died of starvation. And at the time, um, it was a, like a little bit over two years. It was like 28 months. And 600,000 pe 600, people died in, in St. Petersburg during this famine that was caused by the, um, by the barricade. So how profound it was for me to then to step into this space knowing what had happened. And... Um, you know, seeing the vast number of tiny jars filled with seeds and to find that someone had taped a portrait of Vavilov to the cabinet window. So clones like potatoes are not the only crops that lack uh, diversity. Another species I keep encountering is corn. So in the present day, you know, corn is super important because it's a source not only for food for us, but food for, it's uh, used for um, you know, feeding cattle, feeding uh, livestock, and also uh, creating fuel. And so in an effort to increase productivity, right, 94% of the corn grown in America by large-scale agribusinesses is genetically identical. So the U.S. Uh, bank collects this as wide a variety of corn uh, that they can find. And so in this case, for instance, um, these are a, spe uh, it's a variant of corn that has the kernel. Each kernel is wrapped in a husk instead of the outside of the whole corn ear being wrapped in the husk. So it's like garlic. But, um, and they don't know what possible use that could be in the future. But they save it because in a rapidly changing 
uh, climate, you know, you don't know what the genetic information that could go with that, how that might inform uh, future needs for uh, if there's another blight. And then um, this one, the individual colors change from like green to brown to kind of gold, referring to the uh, not only the drawing process, but the native colors of corn. So, so thinking about this lack of biodiversity and our interest in homogeneity, um, I make collages from products from corn. And so these are nacho cheese flavored Doritos. <laughs> and then, um, so in the... Uh, so in the um, risk to, like, oh, and this is the U.S. Bank in Geneva, not, not too far from here. These are apples, right? So apples, like other clones, um, they do not come from, uh, the parent plant does not produce seed that will generate a plant that has the similar characteristics, right? So they are endlessly repeated through cloning. So they'll take a, you know, they clone them, they save them as clones in cryogenic preservation, these big tanks. But they also will have live uh, little branches that they'll graft from the tree onto rootstock, right? But ever, literally, for instance, like Granny Smith apples, there was a Granny Smith uh, a tree owned by somebody named, guess what? Granny Smith, in Australia in the 1840s. And that tree has been endlessly recycled. It's the same tree. All those Granny Smith apples come from one tree, right, that has just been sent down the thing. So if you think about the implications of, of that in terms of seed banking and biodiversity, um, it's a pretty important story. Um, so I, uh, you know, address it through these, you know, not only photographing our giant industrial, you know, preservations, but also through uh, uh, these kind of more metaphoric approaches to the, the idea of kind of this endless recycling of genetic information and the kind of fertile uh, space that that provides. And then um, y'all have probably read about bananas, right? They're also uh, cloned and genetically very narrow, um, and they are being attacked by a blight very similar to the potato blight. So um, this is actually, this is Lord Cavendish, and we're supposed to lose the Lord Cavendish. Um, and it's actually the second one. We lost, uh, there was evidently a better banana that everybody liked better than the Lord Cavendish in the or early 1900s that we lost. And then, um, but uh, I tasted like what they think is a replacement when I was in Brazil. And the funny thing is, is it's square on the outside. But anyway, so exciting about that. I don't want to, I love bananas. I'd hate to think that we wouldn't have them anymore. So um, when, um, so as these, some of the other risks that I encountered was the whole relationship about uh, access to economic resources because this is this the seed bank, the barley seed bank, if you think back to the barley collection room, this is the N Russian National Bank, which is 2,000 miles outside of St. Petersburg. And so one of the risks that I encountered as I'm doing this project is seeing that the economic resources and the funding doesn't uh, really has an impact on the banks. And they're not... Um, the condition of the banks and the size of the collection doesn't really reflect how, by, you know, like the diversity of the place they're in. It really reflects their amount of resources that they can devote to this effort. So these are antique seed vials in of rare plants in Australia. So um, you can see that it's uh, not probably up to what national the international protocols are. So. Um, when I was photographing, um, there was, uh, I encountered a seed while I was at that rare, rare seed bank that literally only grows in a spot on the planet that is the size of the projection of this image. And it was collected because there was a mining company that went into Western Australia and they do surveys before the mining company goes in. And so the, um, they were able to collect this, identify it as being a really unique plant and collect it and put it into the collection.
So um, for me, the picture might look like a microscope or a telescope where you're looking out at the stars so that you have this notion of life is, you know, the way we think about it is life is infinite. But of course, since there's a, a specific number of seeds and a specific place on the planet, the piece is called finite because, of course, there's a finite number. And so in the face of these kind of threats to, you know, like the narrowness of clones or, you know, the threat from climate change or, you know, funding, I, um, there are these hopeful moments that I encountered, right? Like this networks of scientists that might be working in remote locations such as Kuban, Russia, who are dedicating themselves to creating these oases of, of biodiversity. And supporting their efforts is an expansive professional network that fosters the exchange of research, uh, botanical materials, and information. And eventually me, you know, because I became part of this network as I met the scientists and I would ask to go or they would suggest places for me to go. It was all through this kind of network of people, who very tiny network of people that would know each other and kind of uh, allow me access and uh, provide invitations to come. So in Australia, um, I, there's a great optimistic story of the Wallamai pine. So it was a plant that was uh, alive at the time of the dinosaurs, and every thought, everybody thought it was extinct. It was only known from the fossil record, but a um, it just plays into my you know my kid like memories of always wanting, hoping there were still dinosaurs somewhere on the planet. Um, but anyway, so somebody discovered this uh, remnant population of Wallamai pine that were literally from the time of the design, the dinosaurs. And um, they identified it as being, you know, this fossil plant. So they kept it secret until the scientists could figure out how it reproduced and get it into a seed bank. And now it's it's been spread across the world. You can find them in almost every botanical garden. So, and this, this collage is made from research cross-sections of the test trees. Um, and this, uh, this photograph shows seeds being waiting to be placed in the Svalbard vault. So the U.S. box is on the right-hand side, and the little red box on the left is the box of seeds from Uganda, right? And so imagine that one of the most richly biodiverse places on the planet was only able to send one box of seeds to the North Pole in 2010 because of the political instability. <coughs> so at first, looking at at this situation, I was heartbroken because I thought, you know, how much at risk our biodiversity is. And then, um, you know, and then I started thinking about it this other way is, you know, that that somehow this small group of scientists, maybe one or two, managed to collect the seeds and package them and scavenge a box and find a way to pay to ship this biodiversity to the North Pole, right, to Svalbard. And so those plants, those seeds are safe, right? And um, so uh, even though, you know, and as I kind of encountered again and again, these one person's action over time, you really could save planets and that multiplied over 200 years. You don't know uh, what the projector, the future will be, but it, it's better because of the efforts of these individual scientists and dedicated people that are working on the seed banks. So thank you. <laughs>